Welcome to Coffee Charge Conversations here at Real Global Productions. Today is a conservation episode, so I'm quite interested to find out more, not something I know much about. So the purpose of today's episode is Coffee Charge Conservations, and that's why we are joined with Armand Otto. Armand, welcome to the show. Thank you, Mike. It's a huge privilege to be here. It's been a while since you and I have seen each other, so quite excited to come back to Johannesburg to do something like this. And you did your first ice bath today. How did you find the experience? Something that I've never done before. I'm very one for trying to go out of comfort zones and try new things. I would say being in a wildlife industry that is doing things not a lot of normal people would do. So the ice bath was interesting. It's something that I think takes practice to get the concept of it right, though. If it, if it becomes part of your daily usage, then I think it could be an interesting way to get better at running life and going through life. So it's definitely something I might want to consider, let's say, practicing at. And conservation, what, what is conservation about? What does it entail? Well, where do you even start with conservation, man? Conservation is basically, we all live in this beautiful world and there's a concept of making sure that the world is still going to exist for future generations. And there's certain people out there that are trying to think, what can we do to make sure that we still have this beautiful planet to live in? Whether it's based on nature conservation, whether it's based on wildlife conservation, whether it's based on environment sustainability, it's all a concept of making sure ourselves, our families, our future generations still have it to be involved in. So long story short, I would say it's just making sure we all have a future to live and a place to have it. And what's the most rewarding part of working in conservation? So the line of work we do, it's a 50-50 type of thing within conservation. You obviously, depending on what route of work you do, you could be either involved in saving lives, you could be involved in education, you could be involved in getting people more aware of topics that's going on. The work I do is currently working at a wildlife rehabilitation center. So we're involved in a little bit of everything regarding the treatment, the releasing of wildlife. And that's where you can say, wow, seeing animals being returned back into the wild after either being poisoned, hit by cars, whatever it is, that makes the difference. But then I guess also seeing the lives you change when it comes to education. I think when it comes to people in the world, whether it's school kids, whether it's international visitors coming to South Africa, whether it's South Africans coming here themselves, them getting exposed to, you know, we've got such a beautiful country to live in, but we've got so many hardships going on that if you can spend some time in nature, you actually get to, to see the differences and see, okay, this is what we should be doing to get, you know, life in order at the moment. Life in the city is becoming very hustle and bustle and people don't take the time to appreciate what we've got close to us. And what have you discovered about the world since you've spent more time in nature? I've realized that a lot of the things that people think are important are not as important. We live a life where it's all about, okay, I need to make bread so that I can go and live and achieve these things by this phone, by this pants, by these shoes. Whereas when you, when you realize that at the end, you don't take any of your worldly possessions with you, you leave legacies behind. And it's more important about leaving a, a story behind rather than saying, oh, look at this car I bought when I was this age. Look at this house I bought. At the end of the day, yes, you might pass on that wealth and pass those things onwards to your family and to loved ones. But at the end of the day, if you want to be someone that gets remembered, be remembered for the things that you do, not the things that you have. So I guess that would be my concept towards it. And what are some of the biggest threats to conservation today? Humanity. I would say people can be one of the biggest, biggest plagues on, you know, this whole conservation industry. So what we realized is we need to get people to realize the damage we are putting on planet Earth is now causing us to start losing out. I mean, the more people that are being born, the more people that are getting sick, the more people that are taking up areas that wildlife live in, eventually this all starts to play a role on our lives. The more people that are born, the less places there are for natural systems to occur. So it's all starting to become an issue and we need people to start waking up, you know. 
I think this conservation industry is about people realizing, oh, wow, we go on these incredible holidays to all these places where nature is, where animals are, but at the end of it, it's posting photos on Instagram and Facebook and saying, yes, we had this beautiful experience, but we give nothing back to make sure that it can happen again, if that makes sense. How can we give back and instill a bit of hope in humanity again? We just have to start trying, you know, it's the small steps. Everyone is using these cell phones and social media to be so involved and, you know, into everyone's lives that if we now start using it for a benefit, imagine people start using the concept of every Instagram post they post in a holiday location. They mention what are some of the sustainability initiatives that are going on in this area to make sure that this holiday location still exists for the future use. It all comes down to the world is so interconnected. You never know which reach you could get. People within our country start getting exposure to people within different countries. Those different countries then want to start supporting our tourism. And that's just from someone posting a story, just from a location. Someone in a different area might see this location and think, oh, let me get involved and go see this area. Now that could go into someone who might consider themselves as a conservationist, but just someone that loves traveling. And now you've just seen how traveling can be involved in conservation. Boom, who doesn't love to travel? That's just one small example of how we can make a difference. We just have to start taking the initiative on our own aspects. I mean, you can't go up to anyone in the world and say, would you not love a weekend away where you can go and spend time relaxing in nature? Yes, there's people that are going to say we're scared of bugs and insects and things like that, but there's yeah. ways around that. I mean, anyone that goes and spends time in nature realizes the therapeutic effect that it has on your life. And the concept that people are facing nowadays is trying to have nature either within their homes or come closer to them. And people don't make use of how beautiful South Africa's country is. And for people with a lot of stress and anxiety, how does getting out in nature impact those people? So I can give you that in a good personal context. I myself, after, let's say, finishing high school, I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. I didn't know if I wanted to study. I didn't know if I wanted to do this or do that. I got into a very depressive state where I did land up getting, let's say, a psychiatrist to help me to get through some of those things. I was put onto the medications, but being in nature was what managed to get me off of things like that. So I do support the concepts of modern medication and everything, but it's all your mindset. Your mindset will decide if you're happy today. If you wake up in the morning and choose happiness, you will be happy. If you choose to be angry or sad in the morning, obviously that's going to set up your day for the rest of the day. So it's all case dependent on how you line that up. Mental health and the bush or nature or wherever, you can't not associate sunsets, sunrises, waves, grasses, winds, all those beautiful colors, smells, sceneries with not having a good mental state. Conservation is now the difficult one because within conservation, you have people that are guiding. They get to expose people to the beauty of nature. They're taking people to game reserves, game lodges to have big five experiences. They see the beauty of lions, of leopards and everything. But the work we do in wildlife rehabilitation would be people seeing snaring, poaching, vulture poisoning, animals being butchered, cut up, sold, everything like that. So it's 50-50. Being in nature can have happiness. It just depends on what line of work you're doing within this whole conservation industry. And why, I mean, you mentioned poaching there. Why does poaching actually exist? I mean, let's, let's go into some nitty gritty then. You take a, you take a country that's full of, of beautiful Af African wildlife. You take a continent like Africa as a whole, and then you go and deal with all of the people problems. On top of the people problems, you've got wildlife problems like poaching. But now, if you go into the people problems, you go up to a man who's been caught poaching. You ask him, why are you doing this? You won't get an answer of, oh, I just wanted to kill this animal so I can sell something. You get an answer back like the year before, a leopard broke into my entire village and killed every livestock animal we have. The year before that, you'll hear stories about a pride of lions doing the same thing. So you hear someone poaching out of necessity because he just wants to provide something for his family. So you have to take it on a light note. But the thing is, you can't just go and then think, oh, 
I feel sorry for the poacher or something like that. So I would say poaching, number one reason it's happening. Someone who's just in a more unlucky situation than you or me wants to go and get some meat to provide for their family. But then what happens if it's not an animal like an antelope that's caught? You might have something like a rhino. You might have a leopard. You might have a cheetah. And are we starting to go into critically endangered animals, which is going to change the let's say the topic completely, but then you're going to have the argument where someone says, why is that animal not as important as the next one? And this is going to open up a huge can of worms, essentially. I see rhino poaching is always talked about. Mm -hmm. But yeah. why is rhino poaching the only one talked about? Yeah, have that's you noticed my... in our country, you see rhino poaching, you hear about elephant poaching, you go overseas, you hear about cutting down the Amazon rainforest, but why do you never hear about something such as wildlife poisoning, for example. So we're hearing a lot of things that are being brushed on the carpet. We're hearing a lot of things that are coming up and about. Unfortunately, these crimes that are happening are happening, let's say, across the planet. There's a lot of blame that says hunters are from this place, poachers are from this place, people wanting rhino home are from this place, but we find it's global beliefs. And how has so, how's, how's poaching evolved over the years? How did, it, how did it initially start and where is it at now? What are the new threats? So let's say poaching has been going on from the existence of wildlife. We can go back into the early days of South Africa's history where there were people that came down into native Africa from many different overseas countries. They saw animals that they didn't like or well that they thought were animals that never existed in their, let's say, northern hemisphere worlds or different parts of the world. They came here, then it became about collecting. So this is where it was about getting as many animals as possible. And then it started. So not even, to, not even, sorry to interrupt, no, but not even, it. not even for selling, not even to no, make a profit, just, just to say, have it. Initially, it was the concept of hunting. Once certain numbers got hunted and certain animals disappeared, then it started being realized, oh, we need to make sure we conserve areas for future generations. If we go back into, let's say, King Shaka's kingdom, he sectioned off a whole property to keep wildlife in so that they could be conserved for future generations. If that doesn't happen, that's when we start having our issues. So there's some people that will say, Hunters, for example, are bad people without understanding. I mean, if I'm speaking now to, let's say, an area that's full with people in a city, everyone's going to have their mind made up about a zoo and a hunter. Both of those concepts people don't understand fully. And once they start thinking about it, they realize, think outside of the box. Where does a child who's sitting in the middle of, let's say, somewhere like Croatia, where does a child in Croatia decide, okay, when I get 18... I want to follow a career and become a veterinarian or something like that. That visit to the zoo, whether it's an ethical or unethical one, will then start shaping the mind. So all of these different concepts, poaching, hunting, snaring, the bigger we think, the more we start to comprehend. Hunting especially, right now it's the middle of winter. Who likes going to Kruger Park during the winter time? No one on holiday, but that's when hunting farms are operating. A hunter comes out with his entire family and they're then involved in the entire conservation industry because whilst he's hunting, you might have the rest of the family visiting a lodge, staying at a lodge, visiting Kruger. That's all pumping into tourism. That's making this industry. You can ask South Africans who likes biltong. Everyone puts their hand up without understanding. Biltong comes from sustainable and ethical hunting. So going into now tying this together with poaching, you get things done in a right way, you get things done in a wrong way. To tie it together, take someone who's been caught maybe poaching, he's been snaring animals, provide him with a job in the biltong industry, educate him, that keeps him out of the concept of snaring, poaching, poisoning, etc. What is snaring? All right, so snaring would basically be, if you think about it, Take yourself on a walk in a, in a park and all of a sudden you hear an animal squealing. And imagine you are now in a big five game reserve on a game drive. All of a sudden, your ranger gets off the vehicle. He says he has to go and call something in and he has to take you guys back to the lodge because there's been an animal that's been reported in a, a poaching incident. In the context of everyone knowing about rhino poaching, obviously the first thing everyone's going to think is it's a, a rhino that's been shot. But now we hear about things like snaring. So snaring is going to be where 
someone catches an animal in a, a wire or a trap or a noose or something like that, the main premise is to try and get, let's say, some meat or some skin from the animal. And then what happens if the animal that your intention to catch is not, let's say, an impala or a zebra or a kudu or something like that? What happens if someone takes a leopard and they catch that in a metal wire? If I ask you, Mike, what do you think someone would want to use from a leopard or a lion if they were to poach them? I'd have no idea. So we can think yeah. of things like skin, fur, bones, things like that. We've come to a part in the world now where there's things like tiger bones not really being left available in the world. So African cultures, oh, you guys have been using lion bones for the same thing, cheetah bones for the same thing. Maybe we can use that. So this poaching thing is now becoming one where people want to get the parts of animals. People want live animals. There's this whole pet trade as well. There's so many different wild animals become kept as pets because people have this, oh, I want to cuddle ego. And I would say working in wildlife rehab is one of the biggest issues where you have people that have the goodness in their heart in mind, but the practicality of how they, they do it doesn't make sense. Let's say I'm working at a rehab center, then someone on a holiday that stays at a wildlife estate, they all of a sudden see an animal that's been left under a bush by its mom. They bring that animal all the way to the rehab center thinking they've done good without realizing that species of animal, it leaves its baby somewhere safe in a den and then it comes back to look after the baby. You've just caused that baby to become abandoned. So people need to now look into the things that they can do to help appropriately, if that makes sense. And what strategies can people, well, what strategies do you employ to stop poaching or at least try to combat it? I think the best method would be a concept called conservation through education. We've got now all these beautiful places. We've got all these people that are coming and going, but the concepts that need to stick with people is what they learn. So the concept of a lot of the work I do is not really exposing people to the beauty of Africa or the beauty of the animals we work with. I prefer to scare people. In a way, we wake them up to what's going on and then people realize, oh, maybe I should do something to get involved in making a difference. But they always have the problem of, oh, I might not have a pocket full of money. How can I help with something like this? So let's say someone in our general age group that's on a holiday, they're always taking these photos. They now can post these photos. We have got so many different initiatives within the game reserves. So a lot of these different, let's say, research assignments. Now imagine it's you and your family going on a holiday during December to the Kruger National Park. I can give you one species as an example that research is being done on, and that would be the southern ground hornbill. So we've currently got not too many of these guys around. They, families can take, let's say, roughly about a decade to have one egg show up. That egg then gets pushed over in the tree. A leopard takes that baby, a python takes that baby, and now they have to take another so many years to rear one baby. The research assignment, the people that are working with the species, they can't just go and spend all their living hours within, let's say, the greater Kruger surrounding areas to go on a game drive and say, oh, here's a family, there's a family, there's a family. But imagine local families, South African, international, whoever you are, coming down specifically to spend time in these wildlife areas. They may unknowingly see that bird, take that photo. Now, what we can do is with that photo, you upload it to a website where they are tracking the locations of the families. Imagine you've come here on a holiday, but you've been involved in conservation by doing something like that. The locations as well has a lot to do with it. If it's in a tourism location, of course, a lot more education is going to be done. And once people start realizing, imagine someone from the United Kingdom or the United States comes down to this Kruger Park area. They then realize the hardships that's going on that might prevent a future for those areas. And then they start thinking, OK, let's try and help. Let's try and help. Some people do have better finances where they can donate towards causes. But you might have someone that's an animal lover that can't donate. And that's where giving time can be the best thing. How can someone in Joburg or let's say someone overseas that doesn't really get much time to go to the bush or mm -hmm. to a national park or something like that? How can they 
help. Now, this is where you have to start looking into things on your, your own accord, I would say. You have to find what efforts resonate with you, which aspect of conservation resonates with you. And then you have the challenge of, of course, finding the ethical places. You can always find somewhere online that says, hey, we'll take your money and then put it into this. But the thing is, you don't know what happens once you send that transaction. Yeah. A lot of the places nowadays work where you can donate towards a specific cause. All of these PayPal, GoFundMe options, Snap scans, all of that. Those do work. It's just you have to make sure the place that you donate to is using that money wildly. If you see where their donations go into, if you understand where their donations go into, go for it. You can't just donate money to a place who's going to go and buy a Ferrari for their owner or something like that. Mm. So that's in the context of someone that can't get out to these areas of wildlife. There's all these live safaris as well. By following those, that's obviously spending time learning as well. And through that, you learn your errors and your issues and your ways. So obviously, that's a way of giving time. Someone who can't be in the bush, in the bush can go and watch online safaris and get involved in those aspects of conservation as well. So going back to poaching, it's mm -hmm. just something I'm a little bit mm -hmm. fascinated with. And to be honest, I don't know much about so how would you describe if, okay, now you're in the bush and you get a, a call or a signal or whatever that there's poachers mm -hmm. around, what, what does that kind of look like for you? So a situation like that, it's just going to be case dependent on who you're working out in the bush with. Should you be out doing an anti-poaching patrol with an anti-poaching unit. Obviously, there'll be certain steps that need to be followed and called out the same way it would work if you were to be at a bank and all of a sudden there's a call out saying that the bank is being robbed. Obviously, no one's just going to start screaming and panicking. There's going to be an order to do things. Then there will be the anti-poaching unit called out. Let's say you're on a game drive with guests. Your situation would probably to be get out of the area as soon as you can because your guest lives are going to be most important. You could be called for something completely different. Let's say a leopard gets hit on a road and you have to go and pick it up. Obviously, you have to secure the, the crime scene, everything like that. All your different tests are done. The police department is called. It's all just case dependent on what individual situation it is. And what is your thought on zoos? So a zoo, it can be an interesting one because everyone will say, oh, a zoo is a place that has got animals in cages. I do not support the concept of animals in cages. But you have to then put it in the context of, remember, that's just you. You might be in a different country or a different part of the world where people don't have that exposure that you have. No one has a back garden of being able to go to the Pilansburg National Park. You can't just go to Kruger National Park. So someone visits the zoo. Imagine they're coming from Ireland where they don't have rhinos running around at home. That may be someone that's about 17 or 18 years old. That visit to the zoo could be what pushes them into the conservation industry. Now, zoos we have to look at from a very broad perspective because then you can think about something like steve Irwin. steve Irwin is now one of the biggest conservationists that was known to man when he was alive he was the one involved in founding something we know as australia zoo now australia zoo it's labeled as a zoo it's got animals and enclosures but what purpose do they serve they work in conservation through education they work on providing animals with a better home they provide animals the chance to be released back into the wild I would consider that to be both a sanctuary as well as rehabilitation, but it's labeled as a zoo. So it's all yeah. just thinking it's, about. It's got very, I would say it's got very negative connotations. There you I go. think a lot less people go to the zoo this day because it's seen as like animal cruelty. Now what differentiates a zoo from a game reserve that has got fences up and has these animals closed off within where they cannot migrate the same way they used to? So you see it brings that question into the topic now we've got the concepts where a lot of our game reserves are dropping their fences to make wildlife areas a bit bigger we've now got operations going across africa where we want to rewild africa so things are happening the more we look into it the more we find out and the more we care it all starts with caring the more we can achieve with it what species or ecosystems are you most passionate about protecting so what I've come to realize is that 
obviously we fall in love with certain aspects. There's people that love the woodland thickets of the bush. There's people that love to be in the wide open savannas. There's people that love to be in the Feinbos. There's some people that like to be in the wetlands. Then you get it where you realize every continent, every country has its beauty towards it. People are coming to Africa because they don't have this type of wildlife. The people travel to other parts of the world because we don't have that wildlife. So I guess it's got to be conservation of everything. Um, we have a big thing where in our part of the world now, it's big five. Everyone says, I want this, 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 and this. I want to see the lion. I want to see the elephant, the buffalo, all of those guys. Who comes in to say, I want to see the snakes. I want to see the tortoises. I want to see this. I want to see the small things. So to me, I think the small things matter more than the big. And because of that, that is the reason why I'm not, let's say, big five guiding, where you see all of the big and the beauty and everything like that. If we don't have the small, we don't have the big. If we don't have the big, we don't have the small. So we, without yeah. all the species, we have nothing. The concept of a rhino, what does he do? He eats grass, he poos that grass. That grass then comes out and it fertilizes the soil. Everyone loves him, but no one loves the vulture. What does the vulture do for society? He's the decomposer. The decomposer returns those nutrients back into the ecosystem. He prevents those diseases from spreading. That way our livestock doesn't get sick and we don't get sick. So it's a difficult one because you can say who's more important, the rhino or the vulture. But if you know what you're dealing with, you have to realize both play their role in the ecosystem. So if you were to ask me personally, I would say reptiles and the creepy things are my favorite just because people don't give them enough love. But we have to give it all the love. And are there any animals that you are afraid of? Oh, or most of them, man. Most of them. I don't like baboons. I don't like wildebeest. There's a lot of things that look a little bit, you know, on the uglier side of things. But you realize the ugly things need love as well. So like we have a big five, we it's have amazing. an ugly five, we have a small one, we have everything. So it's just that concept to know something that you might think is ugly, someone might think is one of the most beautiful things in the world. Someone might look at a lion and say, oh, a lion does nothing but sleep all day and that's boring. But you might get someone that's obsessed with lions. You might get someone that sees the the shongololo, as we call it, and be obsessed with that or someone who's going to start making tongue faces at something. So it's just about getting to the, the concept of love all. And, you know, if we start realizing to love all, we can start applying it to people. And then we can start realizing mm. the lessons we learn from nature teach us a lot more about ourselves and how to be in the world rather than what we're learning from humanity itself. And that must have been out of your comfort zone as well Very to much. do something where you admittedly are still scared of certain animals. Very but much. For the love of what you do, mm -hmm. you know, you learn to love those, there you go. those animals. Like, let's say one of the most terrifying things you can do is be on foot. If you run into a black rhino, if you run into a lion on foot from eight meters away, your underwear is changing color. But that moment is going to be the reminder of kind of why you do what you do in a sense. There's nothing more humbling than hearing a lion roar and not being on a vehicle or something like that. So going out of your comfort zones is one of the most important things you can do, but the risk factor can also be there. This conservation industry, obviously there's money in it, but there's also no money in it. It just depends on which aspect you're pushing. And you said to me before this conversation that you kind of feel like other people's holiday or vacation is your everyday life what do so you mean by a, that i have a concept where i say my job is better than your vacation and for one yes at first i thought it was a cool way to make people jealous because that's the life that we live in currently it's all about who you are on instagram who you are on social media what you look like what you do for a living and that was the first concept. I said, I just wanted to make people jealous of how cool my life is. And once I got into realizing no one cares what you do, no one cares what you look like, no one cares what you wear, no one cares who you are unless you make it your whole identity. If that's what you think is important, go for it. But when you realize that no one cares about any of that stuff, 
It's interesting because now you realize, I mean, we've both obviously come from a little bit more of a, a privileged background in our younger years and everything. And now you start to wake up and think, oh, no one cares what pair of shoes is on my feet. No one cares what phone I have. This whole what I do for a living now is me trying to find a way where I don't have to live that regular nine to five story. I've seen my friend group from my background go from saying, okay, let's go to school. Let's get educated. Let's try to get this white picket lifestyle. And that's not for me. For me, what's the point in saying you need to go and work until you can retire when you can start living your life from now? Enjoy it whilst you've still got the energy in your bones and the blood flowing through you before you have to, you know, click your knees before you bend down and things like that. So all the things that I'm doing with my life now are what people would pay to do on a holiday. Yes, those people would probably earn a lot more and then be able to pay to do that as a holiday. But those kinds of things aren't important to me, I guess. I get, um, I think about it in a way where I get paid in sunrises and sunsets and that's good enough. That's beautiful. Yeah, I really like that. Um, and I just, yeah, I think in a way it's kind of a relief knowing that people don't actually care about you as much as no, you thought they did. No bother. And throughout high school, it was always a concept of thinking, what are these people going to think of me? Oh, how do I need to dress so that I fit in at school this day? What color shoes do I need to wear? What, what car must my first car be? Right now, the work I'm doing, people have said, wow, there's nothing more I'd be doing than what you're doing. It's such a fulfilling job. But of course, what we put online is what we choose to put online. You never see the hardships. You never see the sorrows. You never see the, the sacrifices. You don't see the gore involved. If I were to say I work in wildlife rehabilitation, you think you fix animals. More animals die than are fixed. More animals are put down than are released. So obviously, you just show what you are happy to show. But when it's those animals being released or those conservation students or veterinary groups that you've educated going back to their countries and saying, you've made a difference in their life towards their career, that's where you know why you do what you do, I guess. What's been the most emotional day that you've had since your time in conservation? Whew. There's been a lot. Yeah, I would say it's probably the phase I'm going through at the moment where I'm realizing there's not enough people and there's not enough places doing, let's say, the conservation work. There's rehab centers out there, there's lodges out there, but there's not enough. And realizing that people don't care enough would probably be one of the most emotional aspects. Each day is different. There's each day where you see animals surviving. There's days where you see animals living. We hear stories like the other day there were 750 something vultures that were all poisoned at once, not a single one saved. Of course, that's going to make you emotional. But the day where you see the place you work at releasing 30, yes, it might not make a difference conservation wise, but the life of that individual is just as important as your life at the end of the day. That takes those emotions back into the positive side of things. So it just depends on if you are people orientated, of course, you would take the emotions in the aspect of, let's say you give someone an educational tour and they all leave crying. Obviously, you'll feel the emotion that you affected the life by that, but you now might have affected someone you don't know who they are, but they could be filthy rich. And now they donate into one of the biggest conservation efforts going on out there. There's so many different ways the emotive impact can help. But it just depends on the type of emotion. You get it a lot of times where people are big into the cute and cuddly. The concept of, let's say, it was a baboon sitting right next to me. He's wearing a diaper and he's holding a bottle of milk. Everyone would be like, oh, cute. Let's put money into that because look at the cute baboon. No one cares about vultures because it's a scavenger. So you Yeah, see, and they've got bad connotations, negative connotations. Why? Lion King, evil, this. Everyone believes what they see in the movies and the TV shows. And what's one simple thing we can all do to help the environment? Care. It's about time we start caring. I mean, look at us. We're in 2024. How many people from our, let's say, background pretend to care. They go out into areas where they're in nature, they're visiting conservation areas, but they only care for that weekend. It's when we come back to home or when we plan the next trip, how are we going to be more involved in conservation? I feel like when I go to 
the bush or whatever, every time I come back feeling like I get a different perspective on the world. Mm -hmm. And then I come back to Joburg, let's say, and I'm back in the busy city, things change within a week. You know, your mm -hmm. mindset just shifts. Mm -hmm. How can someone who, you know, wants to get out in nature, but now they're working in a city, maybe New York, maybe Joburg, mm -hmm. a busy city, how can they spend a bit more time in nature? The best thing for that would to be to bring nature to you. People don't realize there are ways that if you can't be out there because you're stuck in an apartment building or something, you have a way to bring nature to you. There are ways of keeping things in captivity in an ethical way. I'm talking about, let's say, the exotic animal industry, the pet industry, the bonsais, the flowers, the gardening, all things like that. If someone has an apartment where they're limited to space, set up a bonsai tree, set up a fish tank, set up a vivarium, there's planted aquariums, there's all these things that can give you that, you know, take me away from the cell phone, take me away from the TV screen. If you spend two hours putting up a little glass box with some soil, with some plants and things like that, smelling the earth on your fingers and everything, that puts you into that different mode where you're like, whoa, I'm doing something compared to just, you know, scrolling, 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 What do you think scrolling. that does though? Because I mean, I find myself, I'll say, especially since the podcast mm -hmm. is on social media, I'm spending a lot more time mm -hmm. uh, and I wasn't really before. But now when you're doing something you're passionate, social media plays a big of role course. because you want to get out there, you know, so that's the world we're in at the moment. I mean, my concept with this conservation through education thing is how can you educate people from a bigger perspective? And that's through social media. So it's all about finding a balance. You have to have a balance of sleep. You have to have a balance of healthy work life. You have to have a balance of eating and then have a balance of a social life. There's that triangle that says where you've got social life, you won't have sleep, you won't have good work ethic, and you have to always sacrifice mm. one of those things. But if you can achieve balance, you can, you can get it there in the right way. There's, uh, there's a very famous aquascaper whose name was Takashi Amano. And he was from Japan and his concepts were basically to spend as much time in nature to learn from nature. We now have the concept of balance of nature. And once you get that balance, everything falls into play. What can we do as a simple thing, even if it's 10 minutes during our working day to, to get that and just that shift in, in mindset? First thing you do when you wake up, go outside. Don't take the cell phone with, spend as much time as you can smelling the air, looking at the sky, counting something like how many birds can you hear today? How many different noises? All of this, let's call it white or gray noise that we hear in the cities. When I come back from my leave, I sit in my garden and I can hear around about 10 different bird species that when I was leaving for school was just noise in the back of my head. Mm. Now that I've learned about birds, just the stories and everything that the the love between families of birds have and everything, why the gray lurry screams when he does and everything. And you realize, whoa, I'm in the middle of the city and I'm thinking about wildlife, but I'm here around concrete and things like that. So yeah. you don't need to go far to find nature. I mean, Johannesburg is one of the cities in the world with the most trees planted. Look at Pretoria. We get all of the beautiful purple flowers, things like that. No one takes appreciative. And how, so you say now that Obviously, since working in conservation, you've looked at your other mates and the way that they're living their lives. Mm -hmm. how, have, how do you define success in what you do? Well, I guess you just have to do what makes you happy, hey? It depends on what your definition of happiness is. At the end of the day, if you've got a pocket full of cash and that makes a big smile on your face, that's your definition of happiness. For me, like you said, not sitting in, a, in an office from nine to five, that's going to make me happy. I might not have a pocket full of money or the chances to go on all of these expensive holidays or anything like that. But the work I do day to day, I don't feel like I have a job, if that makes sense. I feel like I have a life that just is fun to live. It's and you're just, not, you, said, you said to me that, also offline, you said that you felt like you're you weren't living for the weekend there you anymore. Go. You get a lot of people in the, 
I don't want to call it the city lifestyle, but in the, you know, the not as common things where people are saying, okay, my nine to five is this. I wait for Friday so that I can go and have a, a drink. Then Saturday, the same thing. Sunday, people recover. And then Monday, it's work. For me, nine out of 10 times, I'm saying nine out of 10 times, like there's more days in the week than seven, but <laughs> I don't need to know the day of the week. I don't need to know the time of the morning. I don't need to know the time of the afternoon. None of that matters when you work in nature, if that makes sense. The, the concept of time, the concept of days of the week was just a system put into play just so that people can say, we need structure. And everyone says, follow your passion, you know, find your purpose, follow mm -hmm. your passion. But like anything in life, there's always going to be trade-offs. Mm -hmm. What would you say are the opportunity costs of following your passion? Okay. So you get the good and the bad. Obviously, following your passion, you get the, the sense of being happy. Your day-to-day -day doesn't feel like a day-to-day. -day. It feels like experiencing life. But following your passion, you realize in this current day and age, you cannot pay the bills as much as you would have liked to unless you kind of focus and make sure you have a good plan in place. So within conservation, helping out and doing charity work, you're not going to be in an industry where you're making money. You have to do it for the passion you've got in your heart. There is ways to make money. So let's say there's someone out there that goes into professional hunting or veterinary or five-star game lodging. Of course, there's money in those industries. It just depends on what you want out of it. If you are results oriented, then when you get those results, you get happy from things like that. It's a difficult one. What what else have you sacrificed though, say, since giving up that nine to five? Let's go into the things you lose when you work in passion or when you work away from your friend group and everything. Let's say your best friend is getting married. Let's say someone's having a birthday. Someone's having a child. I mean, you know our age group now. People are starting to put these rings on fingers. It's People crazy. are starting to have children. Yeah. I miss on those things. Let's say someone has a birthday. I'm in the middle of nowhere. I can't just come back or something like that. Whether it's family, whether it's a friend, whatever it is, the place I'm at, there's no hospitals nearby. Let's say if something hits the fan and you need to go to a hospital, you're in a long haul journey. The accessibility to resources can be difficult, but it's all case dependent. Now, unfortunately, the world is evolving in a way where all wildlife areas are becoming a bit more, you know, sophisticated in a sense. And it takes away from a lot of the natural aesthetic as well. We've got banks, we've got all of those things, which you can imagine a lot of people in the line of work I do, do not actually make enough money to even go and get a, a tax number or something like that. And the nature of the work then takes them out of all of the societal norms you would have within a city, if that makes sense. That makes sense. I mean, yeah, I think money is a big thing. Um, money rules the world. It just depends on what rule, on um, what world you want to be in. I mean, I I definitely find that there is a bit of a an issue with that, especially in the beginning, because mm -hmm. it's not to say that following your passion, you're not going to make money. My belief is that you can you can become very wealthy following your passion oh, of course. if you do it of in the right way. Of course. I think it's that beginning part that is so tough it's in the building it up. Remember our early, early 20s into 30s, everyone says it's the years you're supposed to be grinding and doing the, the hard work and everything. Now that I've spent some years within the wildlife rehabilitation industry and conservation industry, I've been surrounded by some of the biggest and most influential people I could have been at this stage of my life but i feel what the, the the next step would be is rather than following other footsteps now the difficult part where you have to throw the risk at being successful is laying your own footsteps and that's where it can take the difference from could you be successful or not and how do you balance like you say you don't really get to see friends and stuff mm -hmm. as often how do you balance that work life you make it work for you. Let's say you're on call 24 hours a day and you're working three to four day, I'm um, sorry, three to four weeks straight and you get one week off a month. Your friends in the bush become friends for life. 
if that makes sense. You might only see people for two days, but you might see them 10 years later in another country and that friendship will never disappear. Lucky for me, working at a very successful rehabilitation center, we had people in and out all the time, both local, both international, both conservationists, but also both general public and whoever. So you get that day-to-day -day work life, you get that personal life, you then also get that, okay, I have friends type of thing, but then you also need that time for yourself. And that's when work is done. You try your best to have that life outside of work. You may never always get along with the people that you're working with. And when you work and live on the property, that is where you face your difficulties. And that's where you have to then, you know, separate yourself and live as a human. I'm lucky the Hoodsprate area is basically a little community where people have got this regular kind of lifestyle. There's restaurants, there's communities, there's activities, there's things to do. It's like still being in a city, but you then realize having city people so close to the bush, that city mentality starts applying to the bush and that's what not everyone wants. So it just depends. You have to work out, you know, your five-year goals, your 10-year goals and think where you want to be in this time frame, what type of a surrounding you want to be in. My friend group right now are busy talking about renting apartments, renting houses, renovations, getting dogs, married, this, that. For me, none of that's important at the moment. For me, I'm still having fun. I'm living my life. I'm doing my grinding years and hopefully in the near future, it'll be me laying my footsteps for the, the next future. And in closing, what's the biggest challenge that you're facing now in your life? The biggest challenge I face at the moment is just realizing this conservation industry is a battle that it may never officially be won. But if we have hope, then with that hope, what we can do is slow things down. And the only way we can do that is when people start to care. So I guess my message to everyone that watches this episode is just start fucking caring. Once we start doing that, we start making a difference. Just open your eyes and realize, hey, next week there's a chance that all of this wildlife, all of this nature, all of this might not exist. So we have to do what we can to make it a, a place where we can all enjoy with our families one day in the future. Armand, it's been amazing catching up with you. Thanks, Mike. Yeah. It's been a, it's been an honor to be on your your podcast, man. It's been incredible to record this episode with you, and I hope the best for your future episodes as well. Likewise, dude, and I just think it's very inspiring. I mean, you reached out to me, and you know, you said maybe we could do a, a little episode on conservation. Yeah, I and think it's a it's a topic that people need to wake up to. So thank you for having me. A hundred percent. I think it's something that's important. I hope that people can take something out of this episode and, you know, learn things that happen in their everyday life that they don't even pay attention there to. You go. We get so tunnel vision that we just need to, you know, open the tunnel and see what's out there. hundred percent. So I just want to thank you for um w being willing to do today yeah, and for your presence and yeah i mean i enjoyed the ice bath i enjoyed our conversation i can't say i enjoyed it i'll say it was eye-opening let's say I'll, i'm willing to try again <laughs> i'm happy i did it but like you said it's about putting yourself into areas you you're not comfortable with for me, the ice bath could be what the bush is to you. You never know. Or well, yeah. sorry, the other way around, rather. 100%. No. It's about trying new things, especially in our 20s. There you go. Yeah. Thank you for being there willing you to, you know, no. go out of your comfort zone today. And thank you to Real Global Productions. Thank you to thank Thrive Thank you guys Labs. for having us here. Yeah. It was an incredible morning. Cool. Lacquer.